This is the last uh, lesson for qualitative analysis. In the past two lessons, we have looked at the test for cations, we have looked at the test for anions. So in this lesson, we're going to focus on the test for gases. So the first question that we need to ask is, when do we need to test for a gas? Now there are essentially three scenarios where we need to test for a gas in a practical setting. First is when we see bubbles. That means a gas is being produced, so we need to test for a gas. Scenario number two is when we smell something. That means that a gas is uh, entering our nose, so we need to test for a gas. The third setting, which is not listed here, is when um, the practical the instructions in the practical exam tells you to do so. All right. So if the step tells you to test for any gas produced, you will need to test for a gas. There are six gases that we need to learn in the syllabus and they are shown in the table below. Now this is an overview of the tests and observations for the six gases that are in the syllabus. But again, don't worry, we'll go through the gases one at a time. As well as um, looking at the tests and observations for each gas, we will also have to remember the color, if any, and the smell, if any, for each gas. For ammonia, ammonia is actually colorless, but it's pungent, it's very, very smelly. Now, the classic, um, if you have yet to have a chance to smell ammonia, the classic way is to um, pee in your toilet bowl, cover it, leave it overnight, and then the next morning, you open up your toilet cover, and then you take a deep breath. What you will smell is the smell of ammonia. All right. Uh, I know it sounds disgusting, um, but in the lab, how do we test for ammonia? Is that we put a piece of moist red litmus paper at the mouth of the test tube, and then the red litmus paper will turn blue. Now, so why why would we need to moist the litmus paper? If you can recall, in the topic of acids and bases for an acid to exhibit characteristics of an acid it must be firstly dissolved in water for an alkali to um, display characteristics of an alkali it must be first dissolved in water as well all right so we need to moist the litmus paper um, so that the uh, ammonia gas can dissolve in it to produce hydroxide ions Carbon dioxide is a colorless and odorless gas. Um, so to test for it, we have seen this before, we bubble the gas into lime water and the observation will be a white precipitate is formed. Lime water is essentially your calcium hydroxide and then the white pre precipitate that's formed is essentially your calcium carbonate. Next, chlorine is a greenish yellow. Uh, uh, gas with a swimming pool smell. All right. So if you go to swimming pools and you smell a uh, particular odor that is the smell of chlorine. Now, but in recording in chemistry, when we record a smell, we do not have to describe the smell in detail or swimming pool smell. We just, uh, if there's any smell, we just describe it as pungent. So the test, in the test for chlorine, we put a moist blue litmus paper at the mouth of the test tube. And then what is going to happen is that the blue litmus paper will first turn red, all right, and then bleached. All right. So essentially, the color of the litmus paper will disappear. All right. A common mistake that students make is that they will record the observation as moist blue litmus paper turns red and then white. Now, the litmus paper can only display two colors, red or blue. It cannot display white. It doesn't turn white. Um, but what is happening is that um, the litmus is being reacted away all right, by a product that is formed when chlorine dissolves in water. Essentially, it forms something like a bleach. All right, so it destroys your litmus, which causes it to um, decolorize. So 
it it is it doesn't turn white it um, per se but the color just disappears so therefore the more correct way of describing it is that um, the moist blue litmus paper turns red and then bleached hydrogen is a colorless odorless gas uh, how do we test for it is to place a lighted spleen at the mouth of the test tube all right what is a lighted spleen is um, that the that is you can see a flame at the end of the the spleen and when you place it at the mouth of the test tube you will hear a pop sound and the flame is extinguished all right that is a classic test for hydrogen gas now oxygen is also a colorless and odorless gas to test for oxygen we need to insert a glowing spleen into the test tube now why is glowing um, in red is because just now in the test for hydrogen um, I mentioned the use of a lighted spleen so what's the difference between a lighted and a glowing spleen a lighted spleen um, like I mentioned that is you can see a flame at the end of the um, spleen now when a spleen catches fire and you swing it you swing it a few times or you um, fan at it a few times you'll find that the flame is extinguished but you will see a gentle glow at the end of the split that is called a glowing split so what happens when you insert the glowing spleen into a test tube where oxygen is being produced it will catch fire again so that is what is meant by the glowing spleen is relighted or rekindled the last gas that we'll look at is sulfur dioxide sulfur dioxide is uh, colorless is pungent it has a rotten egg smell but again any smell in chemistry is simply written down as pungent so how do we test for it is to place a filter paper that's soaked with acidified potassium manganate 7. now acidified potassium manganate 7 is purple and um, when in exposed to sulfur dioxide the acidified potassium manganate 7 will undergo a reaction we will learn this later it's called a redox reaction and then uh, it will turn colorless so when it turns colorless it tells you that sulfur dioxide is present now that we have learned the test for all the six gases a very common question that students will ask is this in a practical uh, exam how do I know which gas to test for there are six of them now we can actually um, deduce which gas to test for based on the reagents that we are adding what do I mean by that for example I have a test tube containing a solid now the solid is gray or silvery and then I'm adding an acid to the solid so what gas should you test for now based on the observations of the re reagents that we're adding we're adding an acid so we have to think about what can acids react with acids can react with three things acids can react with bases acids can react with um, carbonates acids can react with metals all right the fact that the solid is a gray silvery solid that should tell you that it is a metal so when acids react with metals it will produce hydrogen gas right so we should be testing for hydrogen gas now in a separate scenario now I have another solid that is white or any color other than silver and gray all right so it's colored and then we are adding an acid again what gas do I have to test for in this case um, since acids um, react with metals uh, carbonates or bases um, when acids react with bases no gas is being produced so if a gas is being produced in the second scenario it tells you that it must be a carbonate so therefore you should be testing for carbon dioxide gas okay so in a nutshell based on what reagents you are adding and the appearance of the reagents we can actually roughly guess what is the gas that is going to be produced and that will inform us on the necessary tests that we should be conducting 
Now one additional test that we need to learn in QA is the test for water. Now why is that so? It's because whenever we heat a hydrated salt, right? for example, um, when we have hydrated copper 2 sulfate, hydrated meaning it contains water of crystallization, should we heat a uh, hydrated salt, we will form a water vapor which will condense at the mouth of the test tube. So how do we test for water? There are two ways. We can either use cobalt chloride paper. Cobalt chloride paper is actually uh, blue uh, when dry. And then when it turns pink, it tells you that water is present. Or we can use anhydrous copper 2 sulfate, which is white when dry. Uh, if there's water present, it will turn blue. All right, so these are the uh, two tests that you can use to um, confirm the presence of water. Now one last thing that I'll go through for qualitative analysis is the writing of ionic equations. Now why? Because it's often paired with qualitative analysis. If you think about the test for cations, anions and gases, many of them produces um, precipitates. For example, in the test for any cation, um, for example, iron 3 ions, when you add sodium hydroxide, you will get a reddish brown precipitate. And the reddish brown precipitate is your iron 3 hydroxide. In the test for N ions, for example, sulfate, um, we need to add barium nitrate. And then we'll see a white precipitate, which is your barium sulfate. In your test for gases, uh, for example, carbon dioxide, we need to bubble it into lime water. And we'll see a white precipitate, and the white precipitate is your calcium carbonate. So other than asking for the identity of the precipitates, one common question that you will get is to write the ionic equation for the formation of this precipitate. So there is actually a shortcut in writing the ionic equations for the formation of precipitates. And the shortcut again is this. First, you write down the formula of the precipitate. Okay, next, we have to find, write down the ions that are present in the precipitates. For example, in oh, sorry, iron 3 hydroxide, I have iron 3 ions and 3 hydroxide ions. In barium sulfate, I have barium ions and I have sulfate ions. In calcium carbonate, I have calcium ions and carbonate ions. Now in the uh, formation of precipitates, the ions are always 100% of the time in aqueous state. So that, that is the shortcut um, that you can use whenever you need to write an ionic equation for the formation of precipitates.